This is Chapter One of The Mutiny of the Bounty, abridged from William Bly's narrative and other narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Greenman. The Mutiny of the Bounty and Other Narratives by William Bly. Chapter One The Voyage, Otaheite. About the year 1786, the merchants and planters interested in the West India Islands became anxious to introduce an exceedingly valuable plant, the breadfruit tree, into these possessions. And as this could best be done by a government expedition, a request was preferred to the crown accordingly. The ministry at the time, being favorable to the proposed undertaking, a vessel named the Bounty was selected to execute the desired object. To the command of this ship, Captain W. Bly was appointed, August 16, 1787. The burden of the Bounty was nearly two hundred and fifteen tons. The establishment of men and officers for the ship numbered forty-four, and with the addition of two men appointed to take care of the plants, made the whole ship's crew amount to forty-six. The ship was stored and victualled for eighteen months. Thus prepared, the bounty set sail on the 23rd of December, and what ensued will be best told in the language of Captain Bly, whose interesting narrative we abridge. My instructions relative to the voyage, furnished me by the commissioners of the Admiralty, were as follow. I was to proceed, as expeditiously as possible, round Cape Horn, to the Society Islands. Having arrived at the above-mentioned islands, and taken on board as many trees and plants as might be thought necessary, the better to enable me to do which I had already been furnished with such articles of merchandise and trinkets as it was supposed would be wanted to satisfy the natives, I was to proceed from thence through Endeavour Strait, which separates Australia from New Guinea, to Prince's Island in the Strait of Sunda or, if it should happen to be more convenient, to pass on the eastern side of Java to some port on the north side of that island, where any breadfruit trees which might have been injured or have died were to be replaced by such plants growing there as might appear most valuable. From Prince's Island or the island of Java I was to proceed round the Cape of Good Hope to the West Indies and deposit one half of such of the above-mentioned trees and plants as might be then alive at his majesty's botanical garden at st vincent for the benefit of the windward islands and then go on to jamaica and having delivered the remainder to mr east or such person or persons as might be authorized by the governor and the council of that island to receive them make the best of my way back to england setting sail from spithead as I have mentioned, on the 23rd of December, 1787, we arrived early in April, 1788, without any special incident having occurred, in the neighborhood of Cape Horn, round which, according to my instructions, I was to direct my voyage. By no possible exertions, however, could we make way in that route, owing to unfavorable winds. On the morning of the ninth April we had advanced the farthest in our power to the westward, being then three degrees to the west of Cape Deseada, the west part of the Strait of Magellan. But next evening we found ourselves three degrees fifty-two minutes east of that position, and were still hourly losing ground. It was with much concern I saw how hopeless and even unjustifiable it was to persist any longer in attempting a passage this way to the Society Islands. The season was now too far advanced for us to expect more favorable winds or weather, and we had sufficiently experienced the impossibility of beating round against the wind, or of advancing at all without the help of a fair wind, for which there was little reason to hope. On the other hand, the prevalence of the westerly winds in high southern latitudes left me no reason to doubt of making a quick passage to the Cape of Good Hope, and thence to the eastward round Australia. Having maturely considered all circumstances, I determined to deviate from my instructions, 
and to bear away for the Cape of Good Hope, and at five o'clock on the evening of the 22nd, the wind then blowing strong at west, I ordered the helm to be put a-weather, to the great joy of every person on board. With the wind now in our favor we reached the Cape of Good Hope on the 24th of May, where we remained thirty-eight days, taking in various kinds of stores and refreshments. Setting sail from the Cape, we made straight for Van Diemen's Land, which we reached on the 20th of August, 1788. We remained here a good many days, employed in planting some of the fruit trees which we had brought with us from the Cape of Good Hope, in case they might thrive and be of use to the future inhabitants of the island, whoever these might be. We also tried, but without effect, to have some intercourse with the natives, who had already once or twice received visits from European voyagers. Although they came down one day in crowds to the beach, cackling like geese, and we made signs to them, and also gave them presents, we could not bring them to familiarity. The color of these natives of Van Diemen's Land, as Captain Cook remarks, is a dull black. Their skin is scarified about their shoulders and breast. They were of a middle stature, or rather below it. One of them was distinguished by his body being colored with red ochre, but all the others were painted black with a kind of soot, which was laid on so thick over their faces and shoulders that it is difficult to say what they were like. They ran very nimbly over the rocks, had a very quick sight, and caught the small beads and nails which I threw to them with great dexterity. They talked to us, sitting on their heels, with their knees close into their armpits, and were perfectly naked. Leaving Van Diemen's Land, we steered east-south-east, passing to the southward of New Zealand, and making for the principal object of our destination, Otaheite which we saw on the 25th of October, having, during our passage of fifty-two days from Van Diemen's Land, met with nothing deserving particular notice. One of our seamen had died on the ninth of an asthmatic complaint. The rest were well. On the 26th of October, at four o'clock in the morning, we brought to till daylight, when we saw Point Venus bearing southwest by west, distant about four leagues. As we drew near, a great number of canoes came off to us. The ship being anchored Sunday the 26th, our number of visitors continued to increase. But as yet we saw no person that we could recollect to have been of much consequence. Some inferior chiefs made me presents of a few hogs, and I made them presents in return. We were supplied with coconuts in great abundance, but breadfruit was scarce. Many inquiries were made after Captain Cook, Sir Joseph Banks, and many of their former friends. They said a ship had been here, from which they had learned that Captain Cook was dead, but the circumstances of his death they did not appear to be acquainted with, and I had given particular directions to my officers and ship's company that they should not be mentioned. Otu, who was the chief of Matavai, when Captain Cook was here the last time, was absent at another part of the island. They told me messengers were sent to inform him of our arrival, and that he was expected to return soon. There appeared among the natives in general great good will towards us, and they seemed to be much rejoiced at our arrival. Early in the morning of Monday, before the natives began to flock off to us, we weighed anchor to sail farther into the bay, and moored at the distance of about a quarter of a mile from the shore the ship lying in seven fathoms water. Several chiefs now came on board and expressed great pleasure at seeing me. I accompanied one of them on shore, where I was received with much attention and kindness by the people gathered about, as well as by the chief's wife and sister, who came to me with a mat and a piece of their finest cloth, which they put on me after the Otaheite fashion. When I was thus dressed, each of them took one of my hands and accompanied me to the waterside, and at parting promised that they would soon return my visit. Meanwhile, the natives had been visiting the ship and had brought us plentiful supplies of provisions. The next morning early I received a message from Otu, who was waiting on the beach, wishing to come on board. I sent a boat for him, and he came, attended by his wife, and testifying the utmost pleasure at our meeting. 
I was surprised to find that, instead of Otu, the name by which he formerly went, he was now called Tina. The name Otu, with the title of Eari Rahie, I was informed, had devolved to his eldest son, who was yet a minor, as is the custom of the country. The name of Tina's wife was Idea. With her was a woman dressed with a large quantity of cloth in the form of a hoop, which was taken off and presented to me, with a large hog and some breadfruit. I then took my visitors into the cabin, and after a short time produced my presents in return. The present I made to Tina, by which name I shall hereafter call him, consisted of hatchets, small adze, files, gimlets, saws, looking-glasses, red feathers, and two shirts. To Idea I gave earrings, necklaces, and beads, but she expressed a desire also for iron, and therefore I made the same assortment for her as I had for her husband. Much conversation took place among them on the value of the different articles, and they appeared extremely satisfied, so that they determined to spend the day with me, and requested I would show them all over the ship, and particularly the cabin where I slept. This, though I was not fond of doing, I indulged them in, and the consequence was, as I had apprehended, that they took a fancy to so many things that they got from me nearly as much more as I had before given them. Afterwards Tina desired me to fire some of the great guns. This I likewise complied with, and as the shot fell into the sea at a great distance, all the natives expressed their surprise by loud shouts and exclamations. I had a large company at dinner, consisting of Tina and the other chiefs. Tina was fed by one of his attendants, who sat by him for that purpose, this being a particular custom among some of the superior chiefs. And I must do him the justice to say he kept his attendant constantly employed. There was indeed little reason to complain of want of appetite in any of my guests. As the women are not allowed to eat in the presence of the men, Idea dined with some of her companions about an hour afterwards, in private, except that her husband, Tina, favored them with his company, and seemed to have entirely forgotten that he had already dined. Tina continued with me the whole afternoon, in the course of which he ate four times of roast pork besides his dinner. When he left the ship he requested I would keep for him all the presents I had given to him, as he had not at Matavai a place sufficiently safe to secure them from being stolen. I therefore showed him a locker in my cabin for his use, and gave him a key to it. Meanwhile our people were trafficking with the natives and making their acquaintance. Some of the hogs they brought us weighed two hundred pounds, and we purchased several for salting. Goats were likewise brought us for sale, and I purchased a she-goat and kid for less than would have purchased a small hog. Nelson and his assistant, too, our gardeners, were busy all the while looking out for plants, and it was no small pleasure to me to find, by their report, that, according to appearances, the object of my mission would probably be accomplished with ease. I had given directions to every one on board not to make known to the islanders the purpose of our coming, lest it might enhance the value of the breadfruit plants or occasion other difficulties. Perhaps so much caution was not necessary, but at all events I wished to reserve to myself the time and manner of communication. Next morning, Wednesday the twenty-ninth, I returned Tina's visit, for I found he expected it. He was in a small shed about a quarter of a mile to the eastward of Matavai Point, with his wife and three children, not their own, but who they said were relations. In my walk I had picked up a numerous attendance, for every one I met followed me, so that I had collected such a crowd that the heat was scarcely bearable, all endeavoring to get a look to satisfy their curiosity. They, however, carefully avoided pressing against me, and welcomed me with cheerful countenances and great good nature. I made Tina understand that my visit was particularly to him, and gave him a second present, equal to the first, which he received with great pleasure. And to the people of consequence that were about him I also presented some article or other. There were great numbers of children, and as I took notice of the little ones that were in arms and gave them beads, both small and great, 
but with much drollery and good humor, endeavored to benefit by the occasion. Boys of ten and twelve years old were caught up in arms and brought to me, which created much laughter, so that in a short time I got rid of all I had brought on shore. The few days which succeeded were agreeably passed by us in amusements and visits to different places. We became quite intimate with the natives, and they with us. I had usually a number of them at dinner on board the ship, and nothing could exceed their mirth and jollity. Some of my visitors had observed that we always drank His Majesty's health as soon as the cloth was removed, but they were by this time become so fond of wine that they would frequently remind me of the health in the middle of dinner by calling out, King George, Iri no Britanni, and would banter if the glass was not filled to the brim. Thus passed on time, day after day. But though apparently indulging in recreations, we were at the same time fulfilling the object of our voyage, Nelson and his assistant being all the while busy in collecting the choicest breadfruit plants to be carried away with us. In my conversation with Tina and the other chiefs, I likewise obtained much information about the state of Otaheite and the neighboring islands, and of what had occurred since the visit of Captain Cook, of whom they cherished a very fond recollection, preserving with the greatest care his picture which he had left with them. I was sorry, however, to find that the animals and plants which Cook had left on the island had been taken little care of. Tina frequently spoke to me of making an excursion to some of the islands near Otaheite. One island especially he mentioned to me, called Ru Opau, the situation of which he described to be to the eastward of Otaheite, four or five days' sail, and that there were large animals upon it with eight legs. The truth of this account he very strenuously insisted upon, and wished me to go thither with him. I was at a loss to know whether or not Tina himself gave credit to this whimsical and fabulous account, for though they have credulity sufficient to believe anything, however improbable, they are at the same time so much addicted to that species of wit which we call humbug, that it is frequently difficult to discover whether they are in jest or earnest. Their ideas of geography are very simple. They believe the world to be a fixed plane of great extent and that the sun, moon, and stars are all in motion round it. I have been frequently asked by them if I have not been as far as the sun and moon, for they think we are such great travelers that scarce any undertaking is beyond our ability. We had now been about six weeks at Otaheite, our ship lying in the harbor of Matavai, and our collection of breadfruit plants carefully kept in pots on the shore under Nelson's management. The weather till now had been good, and the sea calm. But on Friday the 5th of December the wind blew fresh from the northwest, which occasioned the sea to break very high across the dolphin bank, and in the night we had such a storm that I became convinced it would not be safe to continue in Matavai Bay much longer, and I determined to get everything ready for sailing as speedily as I could. Our surgeon, who had been a long time ill from the effect of intemperance and indolence, died on the evening of the ninth of December. As I wished to bury him on shore, I mentioned it to Tina, who said there would be no objection, but that it would be necessary to ask his father's consent first, which he undertook to do, and immediately left me for that purpose. When I went ashore, I found that the natives had already dug the grave. At four in the afternoon the body was interred. The chiefs and many of the natives came to see the ceremony, and showed great attention during the service. Some of the chiefs were very inquisitive about what was to be done with the surgeon's cabin on account of apparitions. They said, when a man died in Otaheite, and was carried to the Tupapau, that as soon as night came he was surrounded by spirits, and if any person went there by himself, they would devour him. Therefore, they said, that no less than two people together should go into the surgeon's cabin for some time. I did not endeavor to dissuade them from this belief, otherwise than by laughing and letting them know that we had no such apprehensions. In the afternoon the effects of the deceased were disposed of, and I appointed Mr. Thomas Denham Ledward, the surgeon's mate, to do duty as surgeon. Anxious to quit the harbor of Matavai, where our recent experience of the weather had proved that we were not safe, 
I sent the master in the launch to re-examine the depth of water between this bay and Toaroa Harbor. He returned in the evening and acquainted me that he found a good bottom, with not less than sixteen fathoms depth all the way. The harbor of Toaroa appearing every way safe, I determined to get the ship there as speedily as possible, and I immediately made my intention public, which occasioned great rejoicing. Accordingly, on Wednesday the 24th of December, we took the plants on board, being 774 pots, all in a healthy state, for whenever any plant had an unfavorable appearance, it was replaced by another. The natives reckon eight kinds of breadfruit tree, each of which they distinguish by a different name. The plants are best collected after wet weather, at which time the earth balls round the roots, and they are not liable to suffer by being moved. The most common method of dividing time at Otaheite is by moons, but they likewise make a division of the year into six parts, each of which is distinguished by the name of the kind of breadfruit then in season. In this division they keep a small interval called tawa, in which they do not use the breadfruit. This is about the end of February, when the fruit is not in perfection. But there is no part of the year in which the trees are entirely bare. The day after taking the plants on board we removed to the harbor of Toaroa. I found it a delightful situation, and in every respect convenient. The ship was perfectly sheltered by the reefs in smooth water, and close to a fine beach without the least surf. A small river, with very good water, runs into the sea about the middle of the harbor. I gave directions for the plants to be landed, and the same party to be with them as at Matavai. Tina fixed his dwelling close to our station. The ship continued to be supplied by the natives as usual. Coconuts were in such plenty that, I believe, not a pint of water was drunk on board the ship in the twenty-four hours. Breadfruit began to be scarce, though we purchased, without difficulty, a sufficient quantity for our consumption. There was, however, another harvest approaching, which they expected would be fit for use in five or six weeks. We received almost every day presents of fish, chiefly dolphin and albacore, and a few small rockfish. Their fishing is mostly in the night, when they make strong lights on the reefs which attract the fish to them. Sometimes, in fine weather, the canoes are out in such numbers that the whole sea appears illuminated. We had not been long in Toaroa Harbor when an event happened of some consequence. On Monday, the 5th of January, 1789, at the relief of the watch at four o'clock this morning, the small cutter was missing. I was immediately informed of it, and mustered the ship's company, when it appeared that three men were absent, Charles Churchill, the chief's corporal, and two of the seamen, William Muspratt and John Millward, the latter of whom had been sentinel from twelve to two in the morning. They had taken with them five stand of arms and ammunition, but of what their plan was, or which way they had gone, no one on board seemed to have the least knowledge. I went on shore to the chiefs, and soon received information that the cutter was at Matavai, and that the deserters had departed in a sailing canoe for the island of Tethuroa. I told Tina and the other chiefs that I expected they would get the deserters brought back, for that I was determined not to leave Otaheite without them. They assured me that they would do everything in their power to have them taken, and it was agreed that the chiefs Oripaya and Moana should depart the next morning for Tetharoa in search of them. Seventeen days passed, during which I received only the vaguest intelligence of the success of the search instituted after the deserters, and during these days our intercourse with the natives went on as formerly. One day, in walking with Tina near Tupapau, I was surprised by a sudden outcry of grief. As I expressed a desire to see the distressed person, Tina took me to the place, where we found a number of women, one of whom was the mother of a young female child that lay dead. On seeing us, their mourning not only immediately ceased, but to my astonishment they all burst into an immoderate fit of laughter, and while we remained, appeared much diverted with our visit. I told Tina the woman had no sorrow for her child, otherwise her grief would not have so easily subsided, on which he jocosely told her to cry again. They did not, however, resume their mourning in our presence. 
this strange behavior would incline us to think them hard-hearted and unfeeling did we not know that they are fond parents and in general very affectionate it is therefore to be ascribed to their extreme levity of disposition and it is probable that death does not appear to them with so many terrors as it does to people of a more serious cast on the afternoon of thursday the twenty second i received a message from tepahu to inform me that our deserters had passed that harbor and were at tetaha about five miles distant i ordered the cutter to be got ready and a little before sunset left the ship and landed at some distance from the place where the deserters were they had heard of my arrival and when i was near the house they came out without their arms and delivered themselves up this desertion of three of my ship's company did not strike me so much at the time as it did afterwards nor did an occurrence which happened not long after attract that degree of attention from me which it merited this was the cutting of our ship's cable one night near the water's edge in such a manner that only one strand remained whole i naturally attributed this malicious act to some of the natives although the uniform friendliness of the otaheitans led me to suppose that the culprits must have belonged to some of the other islands the inhabitants of which were continually coming and going the consequence was a coolness of some days between me and the chiefs as i wished to stimulate them to the discovery of the guilty parties all their exertions however to gratify me in this respect were unavailing and it has since occurred to me that this attempt to cut the ship adrift was most probably the act of some of our own people whose purpose of remaining at otaheite might have been effectually answered without danger if the ship had been driven on shore at the time i entertained not the least thought of this kind nor did the possibility of it enter into my ideas having no suspicion that so general an inclination or so strong an attachment to these islands could prevail among my people as to induce them to abandon every prospect of returning to their native country the month of february had passed our people becoming always fonder of the otaheitans and the otaheitans of them and we had already advanced far into the month of march it was known that the time of our departure from the island was approaching and much sorrow was manifested on that account one day after dinner i was not a little surprised to hear tina seriously propose that he and his wife should go with me to england to quiet his importunity i was obliged to promise that i would ask the king's permission to carry them to england if i came again that then i should be in a larger ship and could have accommodations properly fitted up in the latter part of march we were busy with our preparations for departure on the twenty seventh of the month we began to remove the plants to the ship they were in excellent order the roots had appeared through the bottom of the pots and would have shot into the ground if care had not been taken to prevent it by the thirty first all the plants were on board being in seven hundred and seventy four pots thirty-nine tubs and twenty-four boxes the number of breadfruit plants was one thousand fifteen besides which we had collected a number of other plants the avi which is one of the finest flavored fruits in the world the aya which is a fruit not so rich but of a fine flavor and very refreshing the rata not much unlike a chestnut which grows on a large tree in great quantities they are singly in large pods from one to two inches broad and may be eaten raw or boiled in the same manner as windsor beans and so dressed are equally good and the oraya which is a very superior kind of plantain all these i was particularly recommended to collect by my worthy friend sir joseph banks i had also taken on board some plants of the etau and mate with which the natives here make a beautiful red color and a root called pia of which they make an excellent pudding at length all was ready for our departure and on saturday the fourth of april seventeen eighty nine we unmoored at daylight at half past six there being no wind we weighed and with our boats and two sweeps towed the ship out of the harbor soon after the sea breeze came and we stood off towards the sea many of the natives attended us in canoes tina and his wife were on board after dinner i ordered the presents which i had reserved for tina and his wife to be put in one of the ship's boats and as i had promised him firearms 
I gave him two muskets, a pair of pistols, and a good stock of ammunition. I then represented to them the necessity of their going away, that the boat might return to the ship before it was dark, on which they took a most affectionate leave of me, and went into the boat. One of their expressions at parting was, Youra no eatua ti vira. May the eatua protect you for ever and ever. Thus, after a stay of five months and a half at Otaheite, we took our leave of it. That we were not insensible to the kindness which we experienced there, the events which followed more than sufficiently prove. For to the friendly and endearing behavior of these people may be ascribed the motives for that event which effected the ruin of an expedition which there was every reason to hope would have been completed in the most fortunate manner. End of chapter 1